Um, let's continue. Uh, Andreas discussed on the amount of devices in the market. And I told you that the N8 is the only one that already has queued inside. So how about the rest of the stuff there? What do we do with this? What was it? Hundred and some dozens of devices that are capable of handling uh, handling Qt, but do not yet have Qt inside. Okay, one problem would be to statically link our application against Qt libraries and then deliver packages of well, say 20 megabytes or yes, yeah, download it with your mobile phone, go to this web page and download this calculator app. Only 20 megabytes, so not a problem. That, that's one way of getting things working, but obviously not something uh, <laughs> like long lasting solution. So here comes Smart Installer to save the day. Okay, what is Smart Installer? It's the idea is that inside your killer cute application, which for me is the currency converter. By the way, I did not get an N8. They just laughed at me. I tried to visit them. <laughs> okay. Maybe it was also because I was showing the application from an N8, but it's not my own, so nevertheless. So when I, di when I do a distribution package out of my application, besides having the application there, I will have a small component called Smart Installer. And when I try to install that package, first the Smart Installer will check whether certain requirements on the device are met or not. Okay, this is a Qt application. It requires Qt libraries with version 463. Let's check whether this device has those or newer ones. Okay. That's cool. Someone's already installed Qt. Let's not download that. But hey, it also requires Qt mobility with 102. That's not here. So next thing Smart Installer does is that it downloads and installs the missing requirements from a server. After that, your actual application will be installed. Okay, and the next time another application requires those mobility APIs, it's, it's not getting re-downloaded, it's already there. So the idea is that you have a small component inside your distribution package that will check whether all the necessary requirements are met. If not, it will download it. Okay, it will prompt from the end user that, hey, can I use network? I would need to download this package. What's already in the Smart Installer server, now this package is, for instance, Qt, Qt WebKit, Qt Mobility. So basically the Smart Installer will check whether these requirements are met or not. Uh, not all devices are yet supported. Actually, only, I think, seven are supported at this moment. So for instance, for N97 Mini, I I tried this myself, I installed new Qt Mobility APIs by creating a package that was dependent on those and had Smart Installer inside, installed it here, and it installed the Mobility APIs. But for N8, I cannot do that yet. N8 is not yet supported. So at this point, only some uh, devices are supported, but th this is rapidly evo evolving. Uh, at the end of this year, 20 devices should be supported. And I'm, pr I'm pretty sure they'll start with the most popular devices. That would be, <laughs> that's how I would do it. And I'm sure they'll just follow my lead. I guess they're recording this session just to know what they're supposed to do. Okay. So the N8 device. It's the first Symbian 3 device, and it has Qt 4.6.3 pre-installed. Actually, the version number is 4.6.4. Uh, 
Uh, there's no SDK for that, but it's just 463 with a couple of fixes. So uh, when you install Nokia Qt SDK, you will get 463, and everything you compile with that goes directly to Nokia N8. Uh, mobility APIs are not inside, but like I said, you can use the smart installer. And actually, I think Ovistar would require you to use smart installer. It has capacitive touchscreen, so multi-touch actually works. I can quickly demonstrate that. I have one of the basic cute demonstrations here called finger paint, which you can now use with the N8 and two fingers. Yeah. Okay, not saving that picture. But that application is using the uh, multi-touch support from Qt libraries. What is also, what I personally love with the N8 is that it has a GPU. Uh, Qt supports OpenVG, I can actually have a hardware accelerated graphics again. Uh, okay, the OpenShield does not yet work. For instance, with Qt Quick, you, you'll actually get those Qt applications working pretty smoothly there because you can just enable the OpenVG rasterization. By the way, it's done by calling uh, one function of Q application, how you enable a hardware accelerated graphics. So that's a, like a, a small thing, but still makes a nice impact on the end product. Okay. Let's go into step-by-step uh, -step instructions on how do you actually build your mobile Qt applications. Before we go there, I need to tell you a couple of things. This is like, in my opinion, for the rest of this course, this is the very minimum of cute basic stuff I, I'm telling. And um, in case you haven't done anything with cute before, you can, I mean, this is not something that after this course you would, you would, you could go to the cute certified developer examination and, and like, I mean, yeah, Tuukka said in the second hour that Singles and slots are like this, so now I'm a certified Qt developer. That's not enough. You, you can take a course, you can do some self-studying or something like that, but this is just to help you understand the rest of what's coming today. First of all, um, on what are Qt applications? These are wrappers around native services. So whenever someone has forged Qt for a certain platform, say Symbian for instance, it basically means that the Qt APIs uh, have been re-implemented using those na native platform services. So someone to takes all the .h files, the header files, and then implements those using Symbian. Just to make them work the same way. Uh, Symbian is actually also taking great benefit of the Open C library, which is a subset of the POSIX libraries for Symbian. But that's, that's actually pretty irrelevant, because theoretically, we don't need to worry about the native code at all. OK, in practice, this is quite often the case. We can just write cute applications. But, like I said, some things are not there yet. Sometimes you actually need to write Symbian code in the middle if you want to do something special. I mean, my currency converter definitely has no uh, Symbian platform code inside. But that's a very simple application. You can actually do quite... Well, you can check, for instance, what sort of um, examples comes with the Qt for Symbian packets. It has its own set of examples and a nice launcher for those called the Fluid Launcher. Q 
Qt for CMP and comes with quite, quite an amount of examples and, and they are they are actually using some mobile specific stuff here as well. I'm not gonna launch these now. But Okay, so we will program Qt applications. What are Qt applications? They're heavily object-based C++. So it's C++ and everything's done with objects. I mean, C++ is like a hybrid programming paradigm in the sense that you can do objects or object-oriented approach or imperative programming, but Qt basically provides you a huge set of class libraries. Hundreds of them, and they all start with letter Q. Abstraction level is pretty high. You can send a text message, an SMS, with just a couple of lines of code. You create Q, Q message, you set the recipient, you set the content, uh, and then you call send. I mean, that's how you would want it to work. But try to do that in Symbian with four lines of code. That's in a bit of a lower abstraction. User interfaces are traditionally built from widgets. And I mean, this is the standard cute way of doing user interfaces. You have widgets. And widget is not something you put to some application store or you can install to a dashboard. In Qt programming, a widget is a user interface building block, like a control. A window is a widget, a button is a widget label. All these are widgets, and they have a common base class called QWidget. In Qt, lots of stuff, I mean, nearly everything is based on signals and slots some way. Signals and slots is a I will exp this is one of those things I will explain you a bit deeply. But singles and slots is a um, way to have objects communicate with each other. And the Qt APIs are, are using this feature. So later today when we will discuss on mobility APIs, we find out that, for instance, each sensor, each sensor class emits signals whenever their value is changed. Or when the GPS updates its location, it will emit a signal telling that location updated. So the APIs are very consistent to what comes to uh, mechanisms. How, are, how should you use these classes? That's of course very good because once you learn something, it's quite easy for you to learn another thing rather similar to that. Qt adds things to C++ which you don't have there natively, like meta objects. You do have meta objects in Java, but you don't have those in C++. But in Qt, you do have meta objects. And um, a common base class, Q object, for all or nearly all classes. Um, meta objects carry <coughs> metadata out of the objects, like string type data of the class names, functions, that sort of stuff. And <clears throat> this is mostly used by Qt internally during runtime, but you can also use that yourself. Memory management, yes, a question. Uh, just a second, you will get a microphone. Do you think uh, there is a, some kind of performance compromise just by using the meta objects because there's a lot of bookkeeping happening in the whole whole system. I think meta objects are um, rather performant into compared to runtime type information in C++, which would be the other alternative. But besides that, this is heavily flexible. Okay, there's always some trade-off between efficiency and flexibility, but. I haven't heard that this would be a problem of some kind. Uh, were there any benchmark testings uh, to see the framework? I've seen some in Symbian when they started porting that was Symbian. It was quite crucial to do those, but 
Honestly, I can't really remember. But what I can remember is that we, nevertheless, we continued studying and training youth. So, I guess it wasn't any any that alarming. Yeah, good questions. Yeah, memory management, especially for Symbian developers. Who is or has been a Symbian developer? Yeah, so you know, memory management is is something that. When you, when you go to a Qt course, you might quite often find Symbian developers there wondering that, what about memory management? Why aren't we yet discussing on cleanup stack or all those two-phase constructors and so on? Uh, this is something that easily, easily um, cheats or like people usually miss the memory management idea in Qt. Qt does not have any kind of garbage collection. When you open a uh, source code, a source code file of Qt, you see loads and loads of new operation, but you nearly never see delete. First thing that comes to your mind is, hey, garbage collection, nice. This I've been waiting for years. But actually, in Qt, you just have parents and child. You have, you have. Uh, ownerships being transferred to other objects. So there are parent objects that are responsible for deleting their children. And that's what majority of cute memory management is based on. So in a way, cute adds things that you might have seen in Java, for instance, to C++, but it is still C++. It doesn't have uh, garbage collection. Okay, time to time someone always says that, hey, but doesn't the operating system free the memory when you close the application? Yeah, it does. But in mobile environments, there's a huge like philosophical uh, difference between how the applications are supposed to run. Theoretically, the application should be on for days, and the operating system, you should be able to run for years without having to reboot that, okay? <laughs> yeah, theoretically. But anyway, it's it's completely different environment than in, in desktop world. Okay. A few fundamental things a bit more deeply. <laughs> Let's start with a small... Not hello world, but something else. Um, what I have here is a main program. It's a C++ main program. The entry point is int main. First thing I will do there is create an instance of Q application. That's what you have in all GUI applications. The responsibilities of the Q application object is basically to handle all the communication with the Windows server, to initialize the session, and most importantly, to provide the event loop for your application, which is this exec function here. So, so the whole like execution time of your uh, user interface, that's going to be inside this function. We're in the event loop waiting for the end user to do something. So you'll always have the queue application there. And then inside, you create widgets for the UI. The widgets can have the written logic, uh, the code logic inside them. That's how you, normally you have some sort of a main widget, main window, that becomes apparent for other objects, creates them inside itself, also has the majority of the logic inside. But here, I have just created three existing widgets. One Q widget, which is just like an empty widget, just to act as a window. It will actually become a window because that one does not have a parent. And then I have these two here, one LCD number, this element here, and then a horizontal slider, this one here. And for both of these, I have actually given this widget to be their parent. So now I would have a tree-like structure like here, 
and the window is going to delete those two children of it. Okay, last thing I need to do before I enter the event loop is to have my um, main, win main widget, or the actual window, shown. Here I will call show maximized because in, the, in mobile devices, um, if you could just call show, it will open on top of the application menu and you would probably want to reserve the full screen. This is what you would get in in desktop environment. I can just, I have it here, written to a main CPP, and And I can go and actually I can compile this in in command prompt. I seem to have updated my Qt lately because I have not increased the font yet. So this is what I would get in desktop environments. I call it so maximized. So it will open it large. Full screen is the third op option where you would have, uh, you would not have in a device, you would not have status bar and, and soft keys. Okay. So here I have a slider and a LCD number and they are in not in any way connected to each other. And that's obviously what I was going after in this traditional example of signals and slots, where we will surprisingly go next. So I'm going to need to use signals and slots to get these two elements to interact with each other. So what on earth is signals and slots? Basically, it's just an implementation of the observer pattern, which is quite crucial in, in GUI programming. You have objects that are waiting for something to happen elsewhere. Like everyone's waiting for the user to press something, or when a button is pressed, some piece of code somewhere is waiting desperately of getting executed. Um, two parts, signals and slots. Signal is a way for an object to tell that something of an interest has happened. Well, who is it telling it? Doesn't care. It just shouts out loud that, hey, I'm clicked. For instance, a, pu a push button, when the user clicks on it, it will actually emit signal clicked. It will tell that, hey, I'm clicked. It doesn't need to be a GUI component. You can have just some asynchronous service handler like Q Network Access Manager. This is for doing network requests. After having the request completed, downloading that stuff over the web, it will tell finished. Hey, the web page is now loaded in case someone was interested. Singles can also carry data amongst them. For instance, QSlider will emit signal changed whenever its value is changed. In code level, these are actually member functions. You define them, but you do not implement these. You just declare them in the header file, and the meta object actually handles the implementation. So the purpose of this is just that you're able to like send a signal, you emit a signal, you shout out loud inside some object that something has happened. You do it with saying emit and the name of the signal, which actually just results in calling that function. Okay, the other end is then slots. Basically, a slot is just a normal member function but with the special ability of being able to be connected into a signal. So these are normal member functions you write to a class with uh, 
separate keyword slots. And then you can connect those. For instance, QDialog has function close, which obviously closes that dialog. If you connect that to the push button signal clicked, whenever you click it, the dialog will close. So that's like, yeah, pretty trivial. In code level, what you see is basically a couple of new keywords, which are macros. Qt is <laughs> using macros quite a lot. But you can treat these as just keywords of the language we call Qt. Signals, like you normally have here, you have public, private, protected. Then you now you have signals and slots. Slots also require the visibility modifier, public, protected, or private, because like I said, they are normal member functions. Signals are always private. You cannot emit a signal of another object unless you're being friends with that. Finally, the connection. Well, there's a function called connect. It takes four arguments. Five actually, but four which ones you use normally. First one, you give the object that is emitting the signal. Who am I listening here? Secondly, you give the name of the signal. That over there in the signal macro. Third parameter is, well, who is listening? The observer object. And finally, the name of the slot function that would get called after the signal is being emitted. So now I said these are names of functions, and they really are. Those macros convert those strings into normalized strings, and um, well, let me put it this way. First of all, when is this connection made? When is the actual connection made? Yeah, runtime, because it's a it's a function call. Okay, so you don't get what? You don't get compilation errors if there's something wrong there. Because this is now using the meta object system. The meta object stores string type data. And during runtime, when I call this function, it will just check that, hey, does this object have a function with this name? Okay, it doesn't. So what? So it will return false, and the connection is not made. OK, if the connection is made, and then the signal gets emitted, what happens then? Well, the slot function gets executed synchronously, meaning that when I have this piece of code here that's emitting the signal, like here, emit clicked, we won't proceed from this line before all the slot functions connected here are executed. Okay, this actually works between threads as well. And it, between threads, it's asynchronous, but normally you use it inside one thread. Yes. Hey, microphone, get over here. Sorry. <laughs> If, if there are multiple slots attached to a signal, so can we decide the order in which? Um, if I remember correctly, please correct me if this is not right. I think it explicitly states that it's unknown. The, correct, the, co um, the order is unknown or undecided. Okay. I think that's implementational details. But because there are no cute compilers in the sense that you would have like different cute compilers, then I don't know why why it should be undecided. But I do you have better knowledge on this one? Because I I'm pretty sure I remember reading that it's undecided. Some of the connections happens inside the constructor, so there is no way to know when uh, the constructor will be called because you have the hierarchy of the classes, so there is no way to to determine. Uh, the order of the the connection, so that's the reason to say that there is okay. no order. But in usually, we we'll, we we'll, uh, the 
there's lots of we call it in the order that you made the connections. Yeah. But there's no way to guarantee that because you can use some uh, slots from the the parent classes, so there is no way to guarantee that. Yeah. 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 So it's not guaranteed, but and usually it's quite irrelevant. You're not supposed to do stuff here that would assume that another slot function has been executed first. You would then do it so that if that's your interest, you would have the object that has the first slot function emit another signal when it's finished or some sort of other mechanism. Okay. So this is always a question that pops out that what is the difference between events and signals? First of all, these are not at all the same thing. But let's have a use case here with our dear push button. User presses mouse on top of the button. What happens? An event is generated. The Q push button object, this one represents the object, it will receive the event that, hey, someone has now pressed mouse on top of you. That's event handling. This is an event handler. What, what does this code in, have inside? Well, first of all, it will animate that the button is pressed. It will go down. And secondly, it will emit signal clicked. At this point, uh, the object will tell others that, hey, I, I, I was clicked. Okay, who, who is listening? Well, it's possible that no one is listening. No one cares. But if we have connected slot functions, they would now get executed because of the thing. So, if you are creating your own widgets, you basically concentrate on providing event handlers. You will write the code that how does this triangular button of mine react when someone clicks on it? Okay, it will emit signal, it will animate this somehow. Uh, you also define paint event. Like, someone asks this widget to draw itself. What do you do? Okay, I will draw a triangular thing here and so on. But if you are using existing widgets, you're not interested in its event handlers. You're interested in its signals. You, you, you'll check from the API documentation, the Qt assistant. You'll check that. Hey, what, how does this tell, tell me when it's clicked? Well, okay, it will emit signal clicked. And then you will connect something there. So normally, you use existing widgets. And you're interested in its signals. And, hey, what I'm doing here is I'm using existing widgets. I had the LCD number and the slider. And now after hours of browsing through the API documentation, I have found out that slider will emit value changed when I drag it around. And then LCD function uh, no, LCD number has function display that I will connect there. And hey, this one, this is so cool. We need to check this ourselves. This is, by the way, coding with notepa Notepad++. Okay. Yeah, so I do have code correction after all. I was just about to say that, unfortunately, I do not have code completion or correction. All right. Let's recompile and re-execute. Oh my god, this is amazing. Now this I will port to N8 and go show them at the forum Nokia stand. This time I will be victorious. Okay. 
So, okay, what's missing here is probably a layout manager. It's not that I can this yet. I mean, I could buy it, but probably not write a good review on it. So, here's an example of using a layout manager in the middle. Q vertical box layout so sets them vertically, like in a column. And for that one, I will add these two widgets. It will take ownership of those, and voila, my killer cute application. Okay, seems to work. Summary on cute basis, basics. Usually we have some sort of a tree of objects, and the main root is like, the main root node is something you, uh, you call, or you show or create in the main function. That one can also act like, it, well, it can include uh, logics of that application and so on. Singles and slots we use for having objects interact with each other. Okay, do we always need to code the whole GUI? No, we will actually use Qt Designer. So I did this now in Notepad, but normally I would probably create a new file or project here. This is a cute GUI application. Let's call this slider -ish. I'm just going to do this shortly, a quick project here. And this is the cute designer. It allows me to drag and drop stuff inside. Okay, so what, what did I have? I had a horizontal slider and an LCD number in a vertical layout and then I had connected, value changed, display and that pretty much should be it. Yeah. And now it's actually also adapting to the windows. So this is what you normally use in layouting your Q widgets. We'll have a closer look on this, on this next. Okay, yeah, slider example. So I have a couple of slides here. More, I will skip these because these are like code details. I'm going to do something else here. And you will have those slides for possible further use. It seems that unfortunately they're printed with a, <coughs> a bit tiny font. But as like I said, you should have at least some of those examples I'm using here today in the memory stick. Okay, but let's check the whole workflow in Nokia Qt SDK. So, this... Okay, let's do it. Concretely, first design user interface. Now I'm actually gonna... I have this crazy idea of an application. I'm gonna do a mobile Qt application. I'll select the folder. It's going to be here, and I will call this a BMI calculator, and where are we now? In Munich? I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I guess I have a couple of these already in my phone, so that's why I need to do some adapting in the binary names. I will just call this Munich BMI calculator. So I'm going to do a killer application that tells me basically how fat am I. The BMI is the constantly increasing ratio between your travel days and your height. <laughs> yeah. Come as a trader, go see the world. Gain 30 pounds a week. They told me. Okay, next thing I can select are all the cute SDKs I have here. Um, for desktop, 
Maimo. Simulator, and then it actually shows me all the Symbian SDKs I have here. These ones I have installed separately. This is what you get with Nokia Qt SDK. You will get one uh, Symbian SDK, and this this one here basically has 463. And this version is always the one that is supported by Ovistore. So this is what you should use if you are going for Ovistore. Okay, actually for this one, 5th edition, I have manually compiled Qt 4.7. So if I would do a Qt quick application for mobile, I would then select this SDK as well. But now, just let's stick with the BMI calculator. Okay, again I get this form here, or the Qt designer. And I'm going to add a couple of elements here, or widgets. I will need one, two, three, and four labels. This one will say height, and this one will say weight. This one says BMI. Then I will have a slider. And the slider is actually for inputting your weight. And this one will represent weight, and by default I will have 80 because that's like the media, mediocre weight for <coughs> people not traveling. The slider will also have the same value, 80. And slider has also uh, properties for minimum and maximum and <laughs> 99, yeah, right. Uh, let's put some German increase there. So, so that I just, you know, <laughs> Sorry, just, I mean, yeah, I love German food, so, so do the Germans. <laughs> I'm going to get so beat up today. Uh, yeah, I haven't done that in a while. Okay, height. Um, 1.8 meters, and with each step, I don't want it to increase as one meter, but by one centimeter. So I can modify all the properties of these widgets here already in the graphical design. I've, I could, of course, do this in the code level, but I mean, this is just because I'm, you know, doing the UI here, so that's more fun. Um, LCD number is, of course, required here as well. And then yeah, let's let's do it like this and and uh, layouting. I could add layouts here also, but I, I prefer this way that I select the items in w which I want to put in a layout, and then from the context menu just select a suitable layout. So three lines or rows, and then all of these. The contents of this window will be laid out in a vertical layout manager. Okay, that's here. What's next is that I can edit some signals and slots here. I don't mind writing connections to code level because I mean that's just one line of code, and then from the code I can see that which component is connected where. But this graphical editor actually gives you ways of connecting existing signals and slots. Like here, I can already set the slider to be connected into this number. So whenever the slider and its value changed, the label will have set num with the corresponding value called. Okay. I don't need to compile. I can preview preview it here. Yeah, it seems to work. And um, yeah, what's next? I guess my UI is ready, but what I actually need to do here is that I will need to code. Yeah. Unfortunately, I will need to code. Well, I don't mind coding. I mean, quite often when you see people giving 15-minute talks on Qt, or how to work with Qt, say, usually they have clauses like, um, 
Hey, I did all this without coding. I didn't need to code a single line. But I mean, I spent six years in university studying how to code, so I don't want to waste that. I mean, coding is okay. And in order, in order to do that, I might want to give these objects that are actually generated on basis of this layout. I, want, I might want to give them a bit more describing names. For instance, instead of using double spin box, I'm going to use height spin box. And this one shall be called weight slider. So now when I'm using an object, I'm using with the name weight slider, which is a bit more describing, especially if you have loads of similar objects. This one is BMI LCD number. And then to the code. So what got generated here actually by the wizard is a class, your own main window class. So Qt provides you a widget called Q main window. But this class here, this is my own main window. And actually, it will, uh, on the basis of what I created there in the UI editor, uh, I will get some code generated. And with this line here, I will have my main window look the same uh, as what I designed. But I mean, this is all done for you in the wizard. I'm not going to go into details. So if I would just now compile and execute this, let's, let's compile this for desktop. It already looks the same than I just designed. Because that's done for you. The, the main application will actually create an instance of your own main window. And then your own main window automatically initializes itself to look the same. But the point here is that now I'm planning to extend the behavior of this class. I mean, yeah, that's, that's coding. So what I'm doing here is a slot function that calculates the BMI. This could be public as well. I'm just, you know, doesn't really matter here. But like I said, this is a normal member function. And now as it's public, someone else could actually create an instance of my main window and then call calculate BMI. But I'm using this like internally inside this class that this is just the way the BMI gets calculated. So, Implementation. Why do I need to calculate the BMI? Yeah, I need sliders value and then the spin boxes value. Okay, let's get those. Spin box will give me doubles and that shall be called height. This one I can access directly. Now you as you see the object name is height spin box. And that one has function value that returns, well, obviously the value. Uh, slider works with integers. Weight slider. That one also has function value. Nice. Then just a bit of calculation. Uh, the results shall be weight divided. No, not why slider. Weight divided with the square of height. Like this one. What's left? <coughs> yeah, I need to display the new value. So let's tell the BMI LCD number to display the value. Woohoo! This is like Java. <laughs> I just tra thinking what I want to do and then transferring it to English or, or translating it to English and then pressing control space, which is the code completion. Okay, so what I did here is that I defined a function on how you would calculate BMI. So now someone needs to call this function. Let's do it here. Calculate BMI. And compile. Yep, 
It did calculate it. But, yeah. Oh, this. Okay, maybe it's not working. So, now I need jingles and slots. Actually, two connections shall be made. Whenever the height spin box tells me that its value is changed, I will have calculate BMI of this class called. Whenever the weight slider tells value changed, I will have this function call. Okay, these ones have parameters and this one does not have. Uh, that's okay. They're just wasted information. Because here, if I would have it as a parameter, I would not know whether it would be the slider or, or uh, the spin box. <coughs> All right. Oh, it works. Hey, not bad. <coughs> okay. So my application is now working in desktop, but I thought this was cute for mobile platforms. Okay, this is now the mobile part. I'll select the Symbian device and press play. No, not really. Uh, So what I did here already, with our workflow diagram, I coded logic. <laughs> try in Qt Simulator or in desktop. Well, okay, let's try it in Qt Simulator. So I'll just select here, Qt Simulator, and press play. Again, it will do a desktop compilation, but now it will show it with, um, with the phone skin. And I can see whether incoming SMSs or low battery levels are affecting my BMI. Probably not. Okay. So this is nearly what it would look like in N97. How about in Symbian 3? Yeah. Looks... Yeah. Okay. Seems okay. So, but this is again only for quick testing. What we'll actually be working with is, of course, devices. So, plugging in devices requires you to configure the devices first. It's, yeah, I, I told you that. You just plug it in and it works. But you'll need to do uh, small configurations for those devices because this one allows you to do on device debugging as well. For Symbian, you will need an application called TRK. I'll just quickly show you. No. Here, I do have an application called TRK. And Basically, I will just select, no, this is already connected. I'll select connected. Oh, now it's using Bluetooth. Yeah, it works over Bluetooth as well, but I mean, that's maybe not so quick. <laughs> Let's no. Yeah, now it's using U USB, okay. Okay. How do you get this one? How do you get the TRK application? Like I said, the Nokia Q SDK has all the requirements inside. So, in Windows, this would be the folder, Nokia Qt SDK. It has a folder Symbian, which has a folder install TRK to Symbian device. And then you just select this one. This is a sys package, a Symbian installer package. You have your phone connected. You'll need to Ovisuit. Ovisuit is 
a general application for transferring data between your phone and, and laptop or computer. That's what you use for synchronizing your Outlook contacts and, and updating your music player, whatever, and you know, that stuff. The same application is used here for installing the sys packets to the phone. Besides TRK, Qt, uh, Nokia Qt SDK also has uh, Qt libraries, Qt mobility, and SQLite. SQL Lite here, so you can you can install these to uh, the phone as well. Yes, please. Sorry, it's not just a second. Yeah, no. If you have your a desktop version and a mobile version of an application, can you synchronize them yourself independently of OVI Suite? Say you wanted to save some data from the mobile. Yeah. To the if desktop I have desktop version and mobile version can I synchronize them um, here I have it's the same program code and actually from the Qt creator you can select different build directories like that they won't the builds build files would not even uh, override each other but it's not a problem if they would I mean you just switch the target platform and then it will recompile it it will regenerate all those build files for that platform. So you don't need to synchronize because you only have one project. But if you have uh, application data you want to synchronize, could you access the mobile phone from a computer or from a desktop application and read, read save files that the mobile application might have saved on the device? So what do you mean what it, what it would want to synchronize well say for example uh, the user may prefer to enter data on his laptop or whatever when he's at home and when he's done that he might load, to load it onto the phone and you could do that with OVI suite but it'd be nice if your application could do it for him or if it was possible ah, okay and when so he's on the road he may want to update this data on the phone and when he gets back home again he may want to yeah I think this is something that's up to you how you implement your application I mean I see no problem there but yeah what kind of functionality would you use to access the phone via USB from the desktop other than OVI suite <laughs> native code <laughs> yeah I don't think there's uh, cute function cute APIs yet to do that but I mean local connectivity is on its way so I think the local connectivity API which is now in te uh, tech preview I think that will give you even cute APIs for to do that at least with Bluetooth but probably with USB as well okay. thanks okay no problem yes Uh, what do you do if uh, you are working on Linux and want to develop for Qt mobility uh, on a Symbian 3? Um, because obviously you don't have Ovistore, you don't have uh, this and that. Yeah, but you do have remote compilation. So Nokia Qt SDK, the Linux version, has remote compilation. So when you select, there's actually a new target. Um, like here I have targets, desktop, MIMO, Qt Simulator and Symbian device. And I can, I can, by the way, modify these from this project sheet. So I'll select here, projects. And I could modify these and add more. In Linux, you should have here, when you press plus, you should have an opportunity to select remote compilation. And when you're building for that, it will actually send your codes to a server where there's Windows machine doing the compilation and you will get a sys package back. Um, then putting that to phone, I don't know on the Linux tools, but it's you can send it over Bluetooth for instance. Okay, yeah, and that's basically it. Okay, thanks. No problem. Next one there. You told us also in the previous uh, session about this remote compilation. I really have a problem with that. So if I'm I am not sending correctly. If I'm working on, on Fedora and I want to compile my code, this will be sent to your servers. Not mine, but... Okay, Nokia yeah. servers, compile there and send back. Am I right? Yeah. 
yeah, it's it's that's all... a privacy issue. So if I develop a banking software, which I'm doing, uh, I will have problems, for sure, because I cannot release my code in, in uh, to Nokia and uh, receive back a compiled code. So I should be able to be locally in every system. What is the difference between uh, Windows and, and Fedora? Um, just to port the compiler on on another platform, but from from I privacy issues, I see a lot on, on regarding this remote debugging, uh, the remote compiling. Sorry, but if you are working in Linux environment, um, your options basically are that you execute it natively in Linux. You can test it there as a desktop application. You can use the Qt simulator, but that's just like a really lightweight route, not really. It's not then, you can, then you can use the remote compilation to get a sys package, which you can put to an actual device where you can try it. Okay, uh, you can also use the remote device access, which Andreas showed. You uh, can access those phones somewhere in, in Finland. And, of course, you can build to Maimo and try it there. The features, what comes to Qt and mobility, they should be rather same in Maimo than they are in Symbian, except for platform security related stuff. Okay, the implementations are of course different, but you have quite a many options here to test your application. And in case you have Linux as a um, developing environment, or development environment, then basically um, what you would need the remote compilation is just for getting like, if you think that it's already finished and now I will, uh, I will just do this one final check in the device. Well, not final check, but anyway, like you're supposed to do the actual testing elsewhere because you can't do really on-device debugging with remote compilation. So I have two options, I switch to Windows or I send to remote uh, compilation, in this yeah. case. Yeah, okay, thank you. but I mean, now you at least have an option. I was, a few years ago, I was forced to change to Windows. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anything else? Yes. So, so why is that so? Um, Nokia's doing quite a bit in providing a server there. Why don't they just provide a compiler for Linux? <laughs> yeah, I I don't know, but like like he said here, it's a long story. So I guess there must be quite a good reason for that because I, yeah, I've done some really old Symbian development in in Code Warrior or something like that, like. It should have worked in, in Linux or something like that. But do you have a comment on this one? Yeah. Um, if, if you look a little bit deeper in Symbian itself, then you will see that it's mainly based on the same ideas as Windows. Mm. Um, that's the, re the reason, therefore, is that the um, developers of the re original platform coming from Microsoft and therefore they built the first compiler um, based on the um, yes on, on the Microsoft compiler. The next step was that they um, changed the compiler but stays on the Windows platform and they never gone away from this platform. So um, if you look at some of the libraries around the compiler, then it would be a lot of effort to change it to another platform. That's the reason, it's it's an historical reason that it's, and it will be on Windows for really a long time. But hey, you can always use a virtual machine. That's how I, I, I that's how I get to use Linux. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so for Symbian, it's rather easy to have this configuration work. I just start TRK, well you saw me starting it, it's now running here. And what I do here is select Symbian device and press play. 
Now this is actually here from the compile output. I can see what it's doing. It's actually executing the Symbian compiler now, and that takes some time. Oh, and I can. Here it is. Yeah. Okay. So this was pretty straightforward. How about my mod then? Uh, first of all. Oh yeah, this thing. Okay. First of all, everything here is explained well in a document that comes with the SDK. Getting started with the Nokia Qt SDK. Especially for MIMO, you need to check this. I, I still need to check this every time. For Symbian, it tells on, on the TRK, but for MIMO, it's slightly bit more difficult, but only for the first time when you do it. Because in MIMO, basically what you have is, this is based on something called MAD developer or MADDE or MADDE in Finnish and what I have when I when I connect my MIMO device to my computer what I actually have here you can actually configure that one um, these are actually they have a local network now through USB. So this is my N900. And I do have Mad Developer running here. I need to start this running on the background, configuring like that through USB I will use this network interface and with these IP addresses. And then I can hook these devices, I can generate a key, or then I can use this, uh, this developer password here. So, I will need to configure the connection in Madde. That, by the way, starting that application, after you have installed it, that doesn't take a long time. I can, anyway, I can get, get to that point in 30 seconds. So, I did not skip many phases. But then here, I will need to configure the MIMO run environment, the device configuration. These are all explained in detail in the document days. But like here, now I would write this developer password that the mod tells me. I can test, test it. Okay, I seem to have 462 in my N900. And I select MIMO and press run. Okay, this compilation also takes some time because nowadays, uh, well, in the, in the first versions, the Nokia Qt SDK, it only did a binary and copied that binary to the device and executed that. Now it's actually creating the Debian packets, which is a distribution package for MIMO applications. Unfortunately, the Debian package does not work yet. <laughs> so you, you still need, if you are doing distribution packages for MIMO, you will still need to... Oh my god, this is still compiling. Yeah, it is it's creating the packets. You will need to manually still modify things related to Debian packaging, like the desktop file, having the icons, these sorts of stuff. But this eventually will be fixed. You will get uh, Debian packets editor to the Qt creator, where you can define what is the icon and so on. So now I have it here. And I seem to have lost my stylus. No, it is here. Yeah. So, I mean, 
Okay, it to took 45 seconds. I needed to do the configuration. But before Nokia Qt SDK, my alternatives were to go inside my virtual machine, which has Ubuntu, inside which I had Scratchbox, which is like another Linux, do the compilation there manually, and then somehow transfer the packets from, ins from within the virtual machine to this device, and then execute it. I mean, that's like... This is nothing. This is this is nice. Now I can call myself a MIMO developer as well. Yeah, with quite huge BMI. Okay. Yeah. One final thing, if you want to use the smart installer, this thing again. Basically, that's made really simple for you. When you create the project using Nokia Qt uh, Creator, you will get the actually make files there. The QMake generates you make files. And now the make file has a separate command called install sys which will take your application and generate an installer package of it, which has the smart installer inside. So if you're doing self-signed applications, only thing you need to do is after compilation, it, you need to go there to that um, folder and say make install sys. That's it. You don't need to define platforms and so on. If you're using Symbian sign, then here's the stuff how to do that. But instead of this slide, I recommend heavily you to go into Pekka Kosonen's tomorrow session on Nokia Qt SDK step by step. I don't think he will go code there that much as I did, but he will go through all this stuff and also how to what, what to do with the packets in, or in case you want to get some money out of it how to put it to Ovistor step by step. So he will handle that and I will stick in the cute level. Okay. This time we won't be late for the coffee. We will outbeat those others. I don't think there's gonna be meat, but anyway, still want to get there on time. Um, yeah. Hey, we do have still 10 minutes officially, and I would say we have 5 minutes time for questions. Okay, if you're really desperate to go on a break, please do have a break, but if you, any questions or something, yes. Um, just quickly, I haven't seen any sort of... Oh, excuse me. Um, Can you hear? Yeah, no, okay. I'm here. Um, I haven't seen any sort of examples that have any sort of try and catch specifically for yeah. on the mobile devices. Does that actually work on hey, mobile devices? Hey, a really good um, question. Try and catch, meaning exceptions. Qt supports exceptions. You can write try and catch there. Qt APIs do not throw exceptions themselves. There's one exception to this. If you run out of memory, you will get STD bad alloc. Um, for those who are accustomed to doing Symbian programming, and well, you know that you have trap harnesses and leaves a lot. In Symbian, this side is, uh, well, in Qt, this Symbian thing is a bit more like, they're sort of like omitting it. Uh, if you run out of memory, your only option is to catch the leave in the main program and then exit smoothly instead of crashing violently. So, okay, you can write try and catch there. You can throw your own exceptions. The Qt APIs won't throw exceptions unless you run out of memory. So that's why you don't really need try and catch. But why you don't see it there even for the out of memory is that only way of recovering would be just to, like, die with dignity. 
that this exceptional safety is at this moment something that is maybe a biggest confusion for old Symbian developers that why is there no mechanism for recovering from exceptions but syntactically you can write triangles there it's not a problem anything else okay you had your chance let's go have coffee